body is not meant for sexual morality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. Flee from sexual morality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexual immoral person sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. So if you've been here for the last few weeks, you know that we're in the middle of this series entitled For the Lord. It has been a, as I mentioned before, it's been a really good one and a really difficult one because we're kind of entering, for the most part, into uncharted territories. We're talking about the thing that oftentimes in church is taboo. You don't bring it up. You whisper it in the hallways. You would never actually say it out loud. And we're looking at our own sexuality as followers of Jesus, regardless of where you come at from that perspective, if you're, uh, well, no matter where you're at on that, that we want to honor the Lord with our sexuality. It's such an important and integral part of who we are. And we don't want to say, because it's been so twisted and, and redefined and abused and, and all those kind of things that we just don't talk about it anymore. I think it's worth the fight. I think it's worth refining some of these difficult ideas and conversations to find the beautiful gold and jewels and diamonds that are, that are found in the Word of God, not as condemning but as loving and full of grace and truth. And so well, this is part number six. We, after today, we have two more parts. So don't worry, there actually is an end in sight. And uh, we will celebrate Christmas, I promise you. Don't worry. Uh, I'll give you guys a break, all right? So we're not, this is not our theme for 2023. Uh, but that said, last week we had an interview uh, with an individual, Dr. Gregory Coles, and it was, it was a really good one. Him and I, for many regards, agree on many different things. We had some differences, and I thought it was a great thing to be able to, one, uh, demonstrate that we, can, we should be able to have honoring, encouraging, thought-filled conversations, even with people that we disagree with, as long as some of the, the fundamental elements are there, right? That, that we believe in Jesus, we follow Jesus, and we believe that we need to submit to him as our Lord, and that includes our sexuality. And so, uh, you know, it was really good to do that. The second thing that was good for is we did a live Q&A. And so I was able to gather up a bunch of questions from you all. We only got to a few of them. And, but it gave me a, a finger on the pulse of where you are at, very helpful. And so in part number eight, two weeks from now, uh, I'm going to actually be going through and tr doing my best to finish this series up, answer the vast majority of the remaining questions, and hopefully tie a really nice bow on the whole thing, and then we can move on to Advent and, you know, Christmas cookies and all those good things. And so... I will say there were a few things in that interview that I personally disagree with, that I, I felt were maybe confusing, and I, I don't say this post to, to undermine anything that he said. I valued his, his willingness to come on and to, to invest into us from a different perspective, a different viewpoint from the same mountain. And so uh, I look forward to answering some of that and clarifying some of that in the weeks to come. But for right now, we are diving into part number six of For the Lord and where we're going to be focusing in on trans identities. Now, I can tell you right now, this is a huge topic, and I oftentimes say there's no way in the world I can get through all of it in this message. <laughs> this especially. This one, the amount of research I had to do for it, the amount of throwing things away and, and, and dying to myself, so to speak, because I wanted to talk about them, but I chose not to because, uh, you know, we just, we're going to run out of time, was quite a lot. And so uh, this by no means is an exhausted dive into the transgender identities and what that means for those uh, individuals and, and what that means for us as a church. But I, I do believe that there's going to be hopefully a new foundation that can be laid or maybe a tearing up of some bad foundations first so that we can lay a better foundation as believers. Let me give some baseline understanding. And this, again, this is not an in-depth, you know, look into it, but let me give a baseline understanding. A bunch of terms I'm going to throw towards you. All of these terms are found in your mobile app notes, so you can find those and follow along, and hopefully they will be a good resource to you. But let me kind of show you maybe the path that this thing takes. First, we, up to this point, for the first five parts of this message series, we've really been talking about, in general, about sexual orientation. Sexual orientation is the sexual, romantic, and emotional attraction that you or anybody else has. 
right? And so we've talked about what, you know, the, the, how as a straight person to live towards God, but also what sins of straight people are. We talked about um, gay sins and how, how we can turn our hearts to the Lord. And so, you know, we have our, you know, if you're a man, are you attracted to a woman? Or a woman, are you attracted to a man? If you're straight and if you are gay, be attracted to someone of the same sex. Your sexual orientation. Orientation, think of it like an arrow of your heart. Where is your sexual arrow of your heart aimed at? But now we dive into a whole nother deeper layer below that surface when we begin to talk about trans identities. Gender identity, by the way, it's, I mean, it's been around, it's been in the conversation, but it has really, in the last, you know, probably 30, 40 years, has really risen to the surface as a predominant thought, especially in Western uh, affluent and rich countries like ours. Gender identity is a person's internal understanding of themselves as either male, female, both, or neither. Now, I will say this just so I can put you at ease. Biblically speaking, God and the Bible does not separate your biological sex and your gender. This is new layers that human beings under the influence of Satan himself, have made up, have added to, have defined, and have continued to reinforce. So this is important, but I'm going to give life to that, okay? Because I want to be really clear. If you're in here right now and you struggle with your gender, you struggle with your identity, I want to make it clear before we go any further. This is not a message, not for one second, against you. God is for you. I'm for you. Church, I hope your heart is for them as well. God loves every one of us right where we're at in the middle of what we're doing. And God's great love for us also calls us to grow closer to him, to become holy like he is holy, and to submit to him daily more than we did before. And so I, I, please don't, if you're struggling with your gender identity online, in person here, please do not feel that this is a trans phobic bashing message. I think you might, hopefully my prayer is you'll find some life in this and encouragement in this as well. But back to this baseline understanding, these gender identities or these, this, this gender identity is how you perceive yourself. How do you feel you really are? In fact, when there is a difference between your biological sex and your gender, how you see yourself, oftentimes the perception of gender wins out over biological sex. Or at least the struggle is so real and so uh, pervasive in their lives that it's hard for them to, to connect their hearts to, I was born with this biological sex, but I don't at all feel that way. Continuing on, there's this new term-ish that has been invented, which is called cisgender. Cisgender means people whose biological sex and gender align. Again, let me reiterate, the Bible does not separate out biological sex and gender. I'm using these terms as a bridge to the society that we're in, not an affirmation of gender ideology. And so a cisgender person is me. I am a biological male, and if I had to use the language of culture, I identify in the gender as a male. There's no incongruency. There's no discrepancy in that. Probably assuming the vast majority of you in here are cis male or cis female. Now, I know right away some of you are immediately offended by that. Don't use that word. I don't want that, to be, that label to be put on me. I understand that. I understand that frustration. But I also understand the importance of being learned and being thought-filled. And if I'm talking with somebody and they're struggling to understand, I can at least be smart enough to understand their language so I can communicate in an honoring and connected kind of way. That's not how I introduce myself. Hi, I'm Jerry. I'm a cisgendered male. Because again, I believe biblically gender and biology and sex should not be separated. Going on, transgender, this is the experience, 
experiencing some level of incongruence from one biological sex. So this is kind of where the rubber meets the road. I'm, maybe I am born as a biological sexed male, but I don't feel like a male. I identify my gender as female or non-binary or something else. Anything in the transgender category or world is there is a discrepancy between your biological sex and how you perceive yourself. Right? And so that's what that, that's what that means. Now, back in my day, which wasn't too long ago, uh, there really was only primarily one I- idea and one word that people used for that. And it was a clinical term. It was called gender dysphoria. Gender dysphoria. If someone, and, and this is going to sound harsh, but someone who was born as a biological female but believes they're a man, medically speaking, doctors would look at that individual and go, there is a mental health issue with that person. Now, obviously, as you can imagine, people in the trans community, they would take high offense to that. And so oftentimes that is an offensive term. It is not used as nearly as often because of the baggage and the weight that comes with it. But I would draw our attention to just perceiving nature, just looking at how God creates and what he has called us to, to be fruitful and to, be, and to multiply. And he has called us to be one and to be full of peace and to be unified. I, I, I absolutely see the validity to what many people would just call, that's my identity, that's my trans, you know, that, that I'm trans because I identify as a different gender. It is many times, all the times, I don't know the ratio, so please don't hold me to that. Don't sound bite me on that. But I believe that there is an enemy that hates people, and he is adamantly, fervently at work to bring confusion, to bring sickness, and to begin to make us question some fundamental things that oftentimes throughout human civilization has not been challenged, and yet it is immensely challenged now more than ever before. You'll notice in the message notes that, that I'm using the subtitle today as trans with an asterisk, trans identities. And I'm doing that because really trans is kind of an, an umbrella term. Right? It, it's, it's, what it does is it gathers up anybody whose gender identities fall outside the norm of society. The norm of society is cisgendered male, cisgendered female, right? That's the vast majority. When you talk about trans anybody, it's a very small minority group of people. And so this idea of trans is an umbrella term that says, hey, you might be asexual, you might be consider yourself two-spirited, non-binary, queer, or gender queer, gender fluid, gender non-conforming, agender, demi-boy, demi-girl, the list goes on and on and on. And it does feel like there are new, new ways of describing what's going on seemingly added on a regular basis. So in the simplest of terms, the word trans with a little asterisk is an umbrella term that I'll probably use for the vast majority of this service to kind of sum it up. By no, I mean, every single one of those ones I read, they have different perspectives, different ideas, different degrees of, of intensity, um, ranging from mild to extreme. And then you get into, okay, then what do we call people? Do we call, what, what pronouns do we call them? I mean, I grew up and it was, you know, if you're a girl, it was she, her. If you're a guy, it was he, him. But now there's they, them. There's Z, them. There's, there's many of them. They're just, it, it seems again that there is a, a, a list that never ends and it continues to be added to. So right now, be honest with me. Just, I did my best to try to describe this, but this is not about me. I, I'm leading to something on this. How many of you just by raising your hands would say, what? <laughs> just be honest. It's okay. All right, cool. Good. We're all, we're all tracking the same page. Good. So I'm, I did my very best, but it, it is what it is. So let me tell you a quick story about that. Did not tell you I was going to tell you this story. My bad. Um, it's about you, though. So <laughs> my dad and I, we are driving to Manistee, Michigan. We had something we're going to go do there. And, and I did my very best to describe this exact same thing to him. He was kind of confused, like, what are these pronouns? And so I, I, I did my best to describe it to him. And I'm driving, and he's sitting next to me. And you got to understand something about my dad. I don't think in my entire life I've ever heard him swear once. Like, the worst word I think I've ever heard him say was jeepers. 
Like when he got the most mad, like jeepers. And, he, and that's like dropping the F word, like what? Right, so, like, so that's who he is. I mean, I'm sure you have, but I, I just, I never heard it. He never really raised his voice, never really got mad. It really wasn't that kind of a thing. So I explained this to him. You know, boom, I did my job. I'm a great teacher. <laughs> and I'm driving, and out of nowhere, now this is going to, I'll qualify this, don't worry. But out of nowhere, in the loudest voice with like the most expressive hand motions I've ever seen in my life, especially from him, he goes this, damn you, Satan, for your confusion! <laughs> Remember, Jeepers was my peak at that point. <laughs> I didn't know if I was going to have to cast out a demon. I don't know what was going on. It terrified me to death. And he didn't even, it wasn't even a swear word. He was actually saying, to, saying damn you, Satan, to hell for because of the confusion that you're bringing. So he wasn't, even then, I guess we're still at Jeepers. <laughs> but you know what? He was being honest. Guys, if you're confused, let me tell you, the amount of time it took for me just to Try to say what I just said in the simplest of terms. Hours, hours I spent writing that portion of this message, trying to get it to be as clear as possible. My dad's observation of the confusion of Satan is spot on. We find in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 33, that God is not the author of confusion. Now, again, I am not illegitimizing the experiences of these people, the feelings, the brokenness, the loneliness, the, the suicidal rates, and, and the, the deep grief and the bullying that they have experienced. I am not for one minute, and if that's you, I am not saying that, hey, it's all in your head, you know, you're just making up. I'm not saying that. Please don't hear what I'm not saying. But can I, let me just say that Satan is a master of deception to take something so fundamental as our, gender, as, our, as our sex, our biological sex, and add a brand, separate it and add a brand new term called gender and then make this the, the pivot point for an entire movement of people who are changing their bodies, changing their chemistry, changing their lives. To do that, Satan is a master manipulator. And he, it is, if you're confused, everyone's confused. This, and, and I'm telling you, this is why I've been saying from day one, simple answers to complex situations is ill-advised. We cannot be believers that say, ah, that doesn't exist. The reality is there's a lot of people that I know that are struggling with their gender identity. Even though I don't believe that it should be separated, they're struggling with their gender identity. And I cannot afford as a Christian to step back and go, well, that's just baloney. I'm not going to deal with it. There's only two genders. There's truth, yes. But then there's the grace of God that says, let me meet you where you're at. And let me begin to minister the gospel of reconciliation, of grace, and of kindness to you. I'll meet you where you're at. I'll, understand, I'll try to understand your language. I will try to be kind. I will try to understand. I'll try to listen. Whether it's reciprocated or not, I think we have a long way to go as truth bearers to bring in the love of God to other people. Dr. Preston Sprinkle, who's uh, not only uh, an author of, of several different books, but really the, kind of the founder of a really good um, outreach called the Center for Faith, Sexuality, and Gender, um, he, wrote, he wrote this quote. He says, if you've met one transgender person you've met one transgender person. I love that quote. It's so simple. First time I read it, I'm like, did he not know how to write a sentence? Um, and, but it's true. We are really good at painting in broad brushes. You meet one transgender person, you see them on the news, you watch a TikTok video or YouTube video and go, that's how they all are. There it is. Guys, hear me on this. There are people that you would, that aren't waving flags, that aren't in parades, that aren't doing, that aren't in your face, there are probably people in this room right now that are genuinely struggling. Some of the struggle, it might be, it might be seemingly small, like I'm just not sure where I'm at. It, in other words, kind of like mild, all the way to extreme where I cannot find peace. I feel like my skin is crawling. I feel like, I feel like my world is falling apart unless I identify as the gender I think that I am. Can I just tell you, 
This is such a broad issue, such a, not an issue, this is such a broad experience that people have that we can't look at one person on the web and go, that's how they all are. Because the reality is you can't look at one straight person on the web and go, well, that's, how they, that's who they all are. We're all different. We all have different experiences. We have different levels of pain and, and different stories and all that. And I'm just asking you, please, even as we move forward in this message, ask God to stir up compassion on the inside of you, to not generalize, not throw everybody in and clump them all in as one big group of people that hate God and are against the word of God. Is it possible that many, many people are just lost, lied to, confused, and hurting. And they've been fed by the enemy. They've been fed by parents. They've been fed by teachers. They've been fed by social media to believe that in their brokenness, in their lostness, that that is somehow to be embraced. And so, if you've met one transgender person, you've met one transgender person. I want to go back to the creation account that we find in Genesis chapter 2, verse 18 through 25. Obviously, not going to read the entire thing, but I want to point out there that God created, he, God looked at Eve, or Adam, excuse me, and he was alone, and he looked at Eve with, Adam with all of the animals and all of creation, and he said, hey, this is not good that he's alone. So I'm going to make for him a helpmate. A helpmate is not someone that's subservient to Adam. A helpmate is a military term. It's, it's a, like, brothers going into battle kind of, kind of terminology. And so he says, I'm going to make a, uh, a helpmate for Adam, which is Eve. But the word that was used there in verse 18 and verse 20 is suitable or fit. That word means opposite to. And so Eve was, we know Eve was taken out of Adam, out of his rib. He, so it, Adam and Eve are similar because they're both humans. So there's similarity, human, but opposite to, suitable, it's the opposite. So God said, when I'm going to make the second human being on this earth, it is going to be a human being, but it's going to be opposite to Adam. Now, you could look at it as a fluke. Well, yes, God only mentions a male and a female, but that doesn't mean that there isn't other genders. I'll get to that in a moment. But this opposite to, same and yet opposite to idea. In, in science, you would look at that as being sexually dimorphic, that biology is found in nearly every single thing, maybe everything in nature, where you ha must have um, two different um, Sexes in order for procreation to continue forward. For males, it's XY. For females, it's XX. Now, there, there's wide ranges in how uh, the animal kingdom and how plants and all that kind of stuff, you know, how, you know, so there's some animals where the male is very different than the female. There's some animals where the male and female are pretty close to each other as far as the way they look, the way they act, all that kind of stuff. But nonetheless, if you would get down to the chromosomal level of who we are, males have XY, females have XX. And no amount of social change, pressure, or acceptance changes what God created. Not even hormones being added to the body will change what God has created. It applies to species in order for us to procreate. Remember what our calling was. A part of it is to be fruitful and to multiply. Mark chapter 10, verse 6. Jesus, remember, maybe it's a fluke. Maybe God only mentioned male and female, but there's tons of other ones that are available to, to choose from. Jesus recounting in Mark chapter 10 of the creation account in Genesis chapter 1 and 2, Jesus reaffirms not all of Genesis, Genesis 1 and 2, but he highlights two very important parts. From the beginning of creation, this is an intentional creating, not a morphing into, not a, not a Darwinism or anything like that. This is a creation, God, a creator God creating, and it says here, from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. So Jesus himself, because everybody wants to throw away the Old Testament is, if they don't like what it says. Jesus himself says, from the beginning, God created them male and female. Now, people would argue, yeah, but they, didn't, they, they weren't as advanced as us. They, don't, they didn't understand gender ideology. We understand it now because we, we have evolved since then. We have, we have discovered things from since then. And I'll get to that more in a moment. 
But to what Jesus says, from the beginning, God, uh, creation, God made them male and female. Let me say this. We are sex-embodied beings with zero biblical examples nor permissions given to establish a gender ideology. There is not an example in the Bible of someone that was born in a particular sex and chose to identify as something else. Now, in biblical times, there was a bunch of people that were doing those things. But according to the word of God, which apparently I've heard Christians should submit our lives to and believe in, to that point, there is no example given. Nor do you have a single scripture that gives us any permission to even begin to explore an idea of separating out how we identify to how we were born. It doesn't exist. It's not permitted. We are sex-embodied beings with zero biblical examples nor permissions given to establish a gender ideology. Let me remind you that just like in the garden, Satan is attacking our God-given identities. Now, we know this. Our sexuality is not the entirety of our identity. Right? We, we get that. Like, there's so much more to us than our sex. It's a part of who we are. It's not everything. And yet a part of the pride and LGBTQIA movement is to take a part of who we are and oftentimes to magnify that and make it the highest version of our identity. To, higher, to prioritize it higher than what it ought to be prioritized. Because no matter what it is, if sexuality is a part of who we are, we're still called to submit it to Christ. Our bodies is not, are not meant for sexual morality, but for the Lord. So honor the Lord with your body. Now, there's a huge portion that I would love to address. There's some common questions, common affirming arguments out there, affirming to that there should be gender identities. And so ones like this, hey, there are non-binary or gender examples in the creation story. There isn't, but that's an argument that people have. Or about this one, in Galatians chapter 3, people say that, you know, that, that God said that there's neither male nor female. So right there, God did away with sex, and it's now fluid and it's malleable. Jesus, now, here's another one, Jesus accepted the eunuch, which means the eunuch, you know, who was, you know, didn't have a sex, you know, which is not true, but uh, the eunuch, the, by the fact that Jesus accepted him means that Jesus is, is accepting gender ideology. Here's another one. Marriage and gender is done away with in the resurrection. And since our eternal being is not going to have gender, why in the world would we care so much about it now? Again, all these are untrue. Here's another one. What about intersex people? Does the existence of intersex people prove that there should be uh, gender, um, I, uh, gender um, ideology? All of these things. Now, this is going to sound like a huge cop-out. And let me tell you, it is. Um, I just don't have time. All of these things, let me invite you to get this book entitled Embodied. It's by Dr. Preston Sprinkle. I believe it is, to my understanding, it is the most well laid out, especially when it comes to terms and understanding those terms. It's the most well laid out book that I personally have read. I'm sure there's probably others. And it really, he really breaks down, especially in chapters six and seven, um, these affirming arguments and, and why they don't hold water. And so if you're really, if you want to really research this, maybe you're like, man, I do want to know the answer to that question or to that idea that you just submitted. Go ahead and get the book. Read it. There's Audible. There's a book that you can buy. Go ahead and let that be a part. Again, this is not meant to be the end all of messages. This is meant to spur us forward to discover more of what God has uh, in his word for us to understand about all of this. Moving on. From the creation story, I want to look at gender roles, because this is actually really important. This is a part where the church has really messed some things up. Gender roles is this. How we are expected to act in culture, right? Like, think of stereotypes. You know, growing up, boys are rough and tumble. They like meat. They play with guns and sticks and rocks, and they pull girls' hairs because they don't know what to do. Right? And girls, they're sweet and they're cute and they're princesses and they love pink and they have dolls and that's what it is. And that's just what it was. And if you were a guy that didn't like exploring woods and playing basketball, you were made fun of. You, you, were, you were laughed at, you were called sissy, you were called, you were called a whole bunch of different stuff. I was one of those boys that didn't like sports. I was one of those guys that would rather be inside maybe playing video games or watching TV than, than going out there and building forts and stuff like that. 
And so the stereotypes, the gender roles in our society used to be so heavy-handed. It was, only, this is what boys do, this is what girls do, this, and there's nothing in between. And the damage from that, especially as it's been added to by the church, the church has been a really big part of that, um, is, it, it, it has hurt a lot of people. And so imagine growing up, and you're someone that you don't know anything about gender ideology. You don't, you don't, you don't even understand what gender is. You just know, I don't fit in. I, all these boys want to go do this, but I don't really want to do that. I want to go do something different. And your parents, your pastor, your teachers, your friends, they're all calling you girl. They're calling you this. They're calling you that. Even worse names. Right? Because of the stereotypes, because of the gender roles and all that kind of stuff, it's just reinforced. And so now, here you are, you're, you've grown up, and you're just, I, I, I don't feel comfortable, I don't feel accepted, I don't feel loved, no one understands me. And then all of a sudden, for the first time ever, you jump on social or a friend at school says, well, what's your gender? What do you identify as? And you go, well, what do you mean? What, what, what are you talking about? And this happens as you know, young, this can happen at four or five, all the way up into adulthood. And you go, what do you mean, what's my gender? I'm obviously a male, I'm, I'm, I'm born. And they're like, no, 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 what do you identify as? Well, I guess I don't really like those guy things. I don't really like doing those manly things. I, maybe I am a woman. In fact, actually, I feel better even saying that. I feel more at home because I've always identified more as that than with the guys. And now the seed's planted. It's been nurtured. It's been growing. And then when now, now that things are becoming socially acceptable... No longer is there any pushback that says, actually, in large part, the problem was how we handled stereotypes and gender roles, and you've been a victim of that. Let us redeem that. Let's heal that. Let's do it better, starting with the church. Instead of us going back to the core root of that, we have a generation of people that are going, actually, I probably identify as something different, so that's my new identity, and that's how I'm going to be called. That's how I'm going to present myself. That's how I'm going to live my life. I think the church needs to repent. The church needs to get our eyes opened so that maybe not anywhere else in the world, but in the four walls of this building and in the, within the interactions of our lives, we can break down the unnecessary gender roles and we can show people a better way of doing that. I'll explain in a moment. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 14 through 16. Does not nature itself teach you that if a man wears long hair, it is, disgra it is a disgrace for him. But if a woman has long hair, it is her glory. For her hair is given to her for a covering. If anyone is inclined to be contentious, we have no such practice, nor do the churches of God. A lot packed in there. I don't want to dive into, you know, hey, was the Jewish culture of the day and age, was it good or not? I mean, there's a lot of arguments, I would say, in, in large part, the way the Jewish culture was, was very, culture was very oppressive, especially towards women, where I'm not giving validity to how the Jewish world treated men and women. There were, there were some issues there. But there's some fundamental truths that's written in this scripture right here. First is, does not nature itself teach you? There is some baseline things that we can look at. If you were to take statistically generalities, you would come up with some pretty baseline stereotypes. For example, men are in a stereotype stronger than women. If you look at all the men, added them all up and divided that out, you would say, by and large, men are stronger than women, or more athletic, or are faster, or whatever, right? Well, what do you do with me then? Because my wife, I mean, I'm faster in short distances, but she's faster long distance. And by long distance, I mean more than six feet. So like, <laughs> like right? So what, I mean, am I, because of that stereotype, am I no longer a guy? Right? So stereotypes aren't necessarily, like generalities aren't necessarily bad. There's some things that we can observe. Typically men are taller than women. Not all men are taller than women, though. 
right? There's some things that we can observe, but it doesn't mean that we are 100% locked into them. But then it goes on to talk about men wearing long hair and women wearing uh, short hair. And it says in verse 16, if anyone, practice, or if anyone is inclined to be contentious, we have no such practice, nor do the churches of God. And I think there is a tension that's held in this that says we need to leave a lot more room within our conversations, in our worship gatherings, in our events. We need to leave room for people to not be the stereotypical male or female, that they can have different interests, interests. They can have things that they like that maybe not everybody else likes. There is some things within a lot of reason that says, go ahead. But then we begin to cross lines. Men dressing and acting to the highest extreme like women and vice versa. That's where they say, no, the church should have nothing to do with that. There's no place for that in the church. For believers, for followers of God, there is no place for that. So hear what I'm trying to say. As a church, we need to be more loving and accepting of boys and young men that come in here that maybe aren't super masculine, they're a little more feminine. It's okay. It doesn't mean you're a woman. It means God created you differently. You're a guy. Awesome. And girls who are like, I could care less about, you know, about Barbies. I just want to like, you know, go shoot some guns and, you know, go blow some things up. Okay, I mean, I'm scared, but okay, like, whatever. I, I think, I think, you know, look at look at our men's and women's events. I'm not necessarily saying ours per se, although we have some elements. Like a typical church women's event that you would go to, right? It's it's tea time and doilies everywhere, and my wife hates that stuff. She's like, I don't care about any of that. I'm not a frou frou girl at all. Women, is there any women here that would identify like I, you don't like that stuff, right? And then you go to a guys thing. I mean, you basically have to, like, punch the wall when you walk in, you know, scratch your belly, burp, fart, and, like, all right, what, what are we going to do today? And I walk in, I'm like, I, I love video cameras, and I like creativity. Can we do some stuff like that? Uh, you know? Uh, even, okay, this is a fun one. Uh, at our men's events, the return that I talked about, like, they have tons of bacon. And uh, when I start, yeah, yeah, right? Okay, tons of bacon. So if you haven't gone to one, just bacon. Just, you know, come. And, uh... And so I actually talked to our women's, uh, the one that, the person that ran, ran our women's one, and I'm like, hey, what do y'all serve? And, and bacon, the word bacon didn't come up at all. I was like, oh, that needs to change. Let's start serving bacon. It was a favorite thing served there. Because you know what, guys, things like that, bacon should not be a gender stereotype within the church. How many women out there like bacon? There it is, right? How many men like kale? I'm just joking. Okay, so, <laughs> look, shifty, I don't trust them. All right, no, I'm just kidding. So, the reality is, you guys see what I'm saying? We don't need to put so much pressure on unnecessary gender stereotypes. For example, 100 years ago, pink was a guy's color, blue was a girl's color. Because pink was more vibrant and bright, it's manly, it's, 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 it's loud, and blue was more subdued and kind. Well, now, <laughs> flip it around, pink is girl's Boys is blue. And then you go from culture to culture, there's different gender stereotypes that are there. Some are true, some are not, some should be there, some should be removed. As a church, we need to make a lot more room for people who don't fit fully within the norm. At the same time, we also have to acknowledge that there is a limit and there is a line. And I don't have clear, direct scriptures to say what it is, but there is, there's an element of this that says nature itself teaches you. And so Deuteronomy chapter 22, verse 5. This is where it starts to get a little bit difficult, guys. A woman shall not wear a man's garment, nor shall a man put on a woman's cloak, for whoever does these things is an abomination to the Lord God. So that's a hard scripture. Anything that has the word abomination, in it, people automatically check out. Let's go ahead and throw this photo up. This photo, by the way, and close your eyes if you're like, you know, slightly sensitive to things like that. So I want this photo to be up there for a reason. I'm not being insensitive. This will make sense in a moment. This is a screenshot of a show. Uh, I believe it's called Drag Queen Story Hour, or Story Time, excuse me. And this is a nonprofit that goes around to uh, libraries, to schools, and has uh, men uh, dress up in drag, and they read stories. And they, and they teach, you know, really not the only thing that they do, but one of the things that they do is affirm gender, you know, gender, uh, explore your gender and all that kind of stuff. And you see the kids right there in those, those men's laps, and, and it's fun. And you see parents bringing their kids there and paying for it, and they have cake and, and, and all this kind of stuff. Now, I see that. 
And I'll be honest with you, my first reaction is I'm sickened by that. There's actually three things that are taking place in this photo. I want to try to describe them to you. The first one is this, exactly what we just read. Men should not dress as women. Women should not dress as men. Within, again, it, like women wear jeans. Like this is a stereotype that doesn't need to exist, right? We're talking about, we're talking about this trans identity world that says you can just become a different gender. You can, you can identify and change yourself outwardly and inwardly. This right here, and I'm going to use this word, and this is harsh, I know. But according to the word of God, this is an abomination. We as Christians have no right to redefine that and to soften that because it doesn't socially fit well. You know what angers me about that is I see those kids getting groomed. I see them being indoctrinated and it infuriates me. Think if that were to be my own kids and that were to those individuals were to show up at my kid's school or at a library function, that is not godly. So that's the first thing that's happened. Some of you guys saw that out of nervousness or you laughed out of, out of just, ah, oh, that's terrible, right? I certainly would never let my kids near any of those men. I believe, I believe there's many issues that are there. But here's the second thing that's going on. Let me remind you that those men are beloved by God. So in our little Christianese world, we should look at the action and go, that, the action, what they're doing, what's being allowed, what's being celebrated is an abomination according to the word of God. But those people who are caught up in it are loved by God just as much as I am. He paid for them on the cross just as much as he paid for me. So when you turn the news on, you see a documentary, you look on line, whatever it is, and you, something like this pops up, but your first reaction is hatred towards them, or they disgust me. Or I, let me remind you again, my prayer is that that man on the left, that man in the middle, that man on the right, that they would feel loved and welcomed here in this church. First thing, second thing, third thing. As Christians, we understand the difference between who you are and what you do. You say things like this, hate the sin, love the sinner, right? We can separate out wh who you are in Christ versus what you do. And we could say, because of who you are in Christ, don't do these things. It makes sense to us. But the third thing I must point out is that for many individuals in the LGBTQI world, especially the trans world, they do not separate what they do from who they are. So when we are over here speaking, let's say we're speaking what I would consider like English. You know, God loves you, but he hates the sin. When we're speaking English, all they hear is God hates you. No, 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 we're saying God hates the sin. No, 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 you're saying, because this is who I am, you're saying God hates me and you hate me and you're against me. And so, hey, what a tricky situation that is. How do we get to proclaim grace and truth when we're speaking English and they're speaking Dutch, right? Right? How do we do that? First off, we have to be, slow down enough and be more mindful of how we connect with them. Remember, we're children of the light. We've been given the truth. We're walking in the truth. We're growing in the truth, but we've been given so much. It's available to them, but they've not seen it. They've not experienced it. They've not walked in it yet. How can we hold them to a higher standard of accountability than what has been revealed to them or what they have committed to? How can we be mad that they're not acting like Christians? or they're not submitting to the word of God. Guys, yeah, the way we talk about people is oftentimes disgusting. It doesn't mean that there's not truth. We just read it. There is truth. But we have to be more mindful. I'm, I have to speed this next part up because I'm losing time here. Is there anybody in here that is a good drawer, especially if you could draw a person that would be one to help me out? If not, this is gonna be a very awkward ending. Come on up, would you wanna come up and help us out? You got this. It's going to be awesome. Come on up. Yes. All right. Thank you so much for saving me. I appreciate that. Come on up here. Go ahead and share with everybody your name and your art skills. How many skills you got? My name is Elena. How do you say that? Elena. I've never heard that before. Yeah, I'm from Germany. Oh, very good. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> and... Um, 
Yeah, I can draw, but I'm not sure if I can draw persons. But okay, well, even if it's a stick figure, that's fine. That's about as all. That's all I can do. So if you didn't come up here, I'd be drawing a stick person. So here's some markers. You have like three minutes. Here's what I want you to draw. I want you to draw yourself. Okay, just draw yourself. That's all. While you're doing that, I'm just going to keep teaching. When you're done, just let me know. Tap me on the shoulder or whatever. Now we go into this next section here, transitioning. Transitioning is very important to this whole conversation. I cannot leave it out. Transitioning. Oh, please, yeah, go ahead and use as many colors as you want. Uh, Racers right there, whatever you need. Transitioning, because there's one thing to believe that you're something else, but then there's a whole other thing to begin transitioning towards that. Transitioning, there's many different ways that people transition in the trans world. There's socially, and so like you could transition, you know, I'm changing my gender on social media, I'm asking people to call me by a different pronoun, I'm, I'm presenting my, I'm, I'm, you know, dressing and presenting myself as, if I was born a male, I'm presenting as a woman, whatever the case may be. And so there's socially, there's medically, and now that's where you actually start receiving cross-sex hormone therapy, where you start getting, if you're a guy, you start getting estrogen. If you're a girl, you start getting um, testosterone or versions of that. And then there is the surgical transitioning, which is an, uh, it's called sex reassignment surgery. There's other names for it. And so very in-depth. A lot is going on there. So much of this requires the complicity of parents. It re- requires... Uh, uh, superintendents and teachers and doctors and and leaders to comply with this, to encourage it, to promote it, and to push it forward. If you feel like a girl, start acting, talking, and presenting as a girl. Now, there's a wide range within that. Wide, wide range within that. There's from as small as as just wearing maybe a, a, a color that you feel is feminine if you're a guy, all the way up to a physical, surgical, irreversible change in your body. Okay? I wish I had time to go into this, but let me point you to a pastoral paper by the same organization as this book, and and you can download it. It goes much more in depth about the three different types of transitioning, social, medical, and surgical. Very good, very in-depth read. It helps you understand the dangers of it, how unhealthy it is, the controversies over it. It certainly is not complete, but it's important. Again, that's in your notes, as it always is. Let me read Genesis chapter 1, verse 27 through 28. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. How many times did God have to say it? I created you, male and female. And God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue. Oh, that was quick, and that was very good. Okay, yeah, so hang tight. Hang tight, okay? We're getting there. We're getting there. Okay, so let me remind you from the scripture I just read, men and women, binary, two, men and women, are the image bearers of God's invisible likeness. We, it says right there, in the image of God, he created us. We are the image bearers of God. Remember, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. You are the image bearer of God. Whether you love your nose or hate your nose, whether you like your height or hate your height, you are the image bearer of God. So the challenge for us is do not object to, redefine, or change what God said was very good. He said in all creation, things are good, good, good. When he made human beings, he said, very good. It's the only thing he said very good to. Who are we to object to that? One. Who are we to redefine that? Who are we to change what God said is very good? I'm not saying that you're not experiencing these emotions. You're not going through the torment. My heart breaks for those of you that are going through this, but we still have our response to the difficulties that we go to. Is it going to be biblical or not? To take it a step further, we have no right to make a mockery of what God created. We have no right to drug up what God created. And we have no right to mutilate the temple of the Holy Spirit. Socially, mockery. Chemically, medically, drugging us up. And through surgery, carving us up and and mutilating the temple of the Holy Spirit. It is, whether we realize it or not, it is an assault and it is an affront to the creative goodness of God. As Christians, it cannot be a part of the answer. 
Love, compassion, walking with people, weeping with people, hearing their stories must be a part of the solution, but not that. So, here you go. Thank you. Here's an eraser. What I want you to do is this. I want you to erase the parts of you that you can't see. So what I mean by that is this. With your human eyes, right, you can see me. You can probably draw me. But you're looking through your eyes right now. Can you see your hands? Yes. Okay, so we're going to keep your hands. Can you see your feet? Yes. Okay. Take this. Can you see your neck? <laughs> no. Erase the neck. Okay. Can you see your ears? No. Erase the ears. I didn't draw ears. Good enough. <laughs> can you see the top? Well, they're in there, but can you see the top of your head? No. All right, well, look, look through your eyes. Where can you see the beginning of your head? Right over here. Okay, then erase, erase what you can't see, including the hair that you can't see. Okay. Now, this will probably be in part. Can you see your nose? Kind of. Kind of? Okay. Erase the part that you can't see. <laughs> probably can't see the back part, maybe the tip. Okay. Can you see your eyes? What about your eyebrows? Eyebrows? Eyebrows. Uh, I can kind of see mine, but I have like mega brows. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, like if there was an evil character in a cartoon, it would be this guy. Okay. Now this is hard because it's not a 3D image, but here's some other things you can't see. You can't see your back, right? You can't see that, right? You can't see the back of your neck, so that's, again, it's erased, that's good. There's a whole bunch of your hair that you can't see. There is, I've got to believe, there's like, you know, parts of you that we can't see that aren't even a part of this drawing. But, so now, looking at this, this is what you see of yourself. If you didn't have a mirror, if you didn't have a cell phone, this is what you see. So, if I were to only ask you to draw what you see, what you observe, how, how you see yourself, this is the kind, this is what you would say you are, Right? But there's so much more to you, right? Eyes and eyebrows and a top of a head, which is nice to have, right? Like, there's so much more to you. Here's what I want, here's what I want to point out on that. In Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9. The heart is deceitful above all and is desperately sick. Who can understand? This is a silly example. But if you're only seeing, who you, seeing through your eyes, you would present this as the completeness of you. If you had no idea of a mirror or anything else, you would say, this is what I look like. My point on that is this. All of us, our hearts, our emotions, our minds, they are deceitful. Not to be trusted. Not to, certainly not to change our lives off of. Certainly not to say, this is who I am which is why we need the word of God, which never changes, is not confusing, and is giving life everlasting to keep us on track. Thank you so much. Thank you. Give it up for him. I know I'm over time. For those of you that are waiting for your, for your guys to return, you can go and just leave now if you need to. I'm going to finish up very quickly. I sat for maybe... Eight hours agonizing over this message, over this part of this message. Finding, researching stats and social, uh, of a whole, like what I would call like the world gone crazy. And we see it. We look at, we see the legal ramifications, parents losing their parental rights in other countries and now starting in America if they choose not to get cross-sex hormones for their, for their 13-year-old or for their 8-year-old. We see and hear about bathroom wars. If one of them come in my bathroom, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna take my kids out of school. Like we, we see the wars. We hear now that misgendering, like if you are presenting as a woman and I say, what's up, man? And now that's considered violence towards you. We see this. We see the rapid onset gender dysphoria where it's so quick, it, like there was no signs and all of a sudden it's right there. We see the social contagia where it seems like everyone's doing it now and it's becoming popular, it's becoming the it thing. In fact, if you're not doing it, you're the weird odd, excuse me, person that's out. 
We see people identifying on the extreme cases as animals and, and completely outside of our species. We see the my truth chaos that it's caused. We see media saturation and TikTok theology and social media indoctrination. We see teachers that are pushing this stuff. We see politicians that are pushing this stuff. I agonized for hours. I had lists and I had stats and I had pictures and I had all of this stuff. You guys should see my search engine history. That, <laughs> it's crazy because I researched all of this stuff because I was going to come and I was going to present a, cra- a case of how crazy all of this is, how out of control it's gotten, how the world is in chaos. But the Lord convicted me because I wanted to. I was pushing for it. God said, don't. Let my word stand. You don't need to add to the fear-mongering. You don't need to add to the anger. Let my word bring clarity. This is the word that God gave me. Colossians chapter 3, verse 1 and 2 and verse 5. If you then have been raised with Christ, Christians, that's us, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on the earth. Verse 5, put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, covetedness, which is idolatry. Church, we could go dumpster diving in the filth of this culture. I could play video clips that will blow your mind, that will make you go out and want to fight every person that is for that kind of talk and that ideology that will make you hate people. Guys, as those who are Christ followers, let us set our minds on things that are above. Not be ignorant that this is how the enemy is working. We need to know that the enemy, he is roaming around like a lion seeking whom he might devour. He's picking people off, our children, our grandchildren. He's picking them off left and right. But as believers, our responsibility is to not set our eyes on the things that are earthly within us and within other people. To shine bright is not to yell at darkness. To shine bright is to say, in all of your pain, your hurt, and confusion, the church is not going to add to it, but the church is going to be a beacon that oftentimes is the exact opposite of what culture has to say, which maybe right now is hated, right now is rejected, it's despised, we're going to be called bigot, we're going to be called all these things, but let me challenge you that if we're going to be called bigot, let it only be because we believe what the word says and we are so full of love and grace and truth that we are just standing with God, not against anybody else. Let's not be called bigots because we go above and beyond that and we're actually cruel to people. Bigots because we're people that don't want to hear and don't want to take time and don't want to walk with people in the darkest, most difficult moments of their lives. Church, we've got a black eye because of the way that as Christians we have acted over the years that we deserve. But we don't have to live with that for the rest of our lives. We can begin to redeem what many Christians who kept their eyes focused on the filth, we can redeem that as we fix our eyes on the Lord. There's a million things that we could talk about. I'm going to talk about in part number eight. You know, what about pronouns? What do we call people? Do we call them the name they want, the pronoun they want? Do we, how, do we, how are we friends with them without compromise? I'm going to talk about those things, but I don't want to get in the weeds of those details. I want us to walk away with committed hearts that say we will be a people focused on the goodness and the truth of God, and that will be magnetically drawing people to the transformative power of Jesus Christ. I end with this, a picture on the screen of a, of a pride party. That's the transgender flag right there. Let me remind you that this is not an anonymous, faceless, nameless sea of sinners. This is an, a tremendous ministry opportunity. And whether it be a large gathering like that or one person in this room that comes in and says, I will give God one more try, and that's it. What a ministry opportunity that we can bless the confused and lied to children of God that have been that have been manipulated by Satan to be able to sit with people and to cry over the fact that they're suicidal and they're hopeless but then to give them hope 
to sit with parents who are pressured and scared that they're going to lose their kids to suicide or lose their kids to the law because if, if they don't do what their children is demanding of them and what society is demanding of them, to be able to help kind of co-parent with them in the most difficult season of their lives. Ministry opportunity to those that have been irreversibly scarred by surgery or have been changed chemically because of the decisions they made. And it's not as easy as just stop wearing that dress. We actually have to deal with the ugliness of decisions, and yet we sit with them, and even though there may not be clean, simple, straightforward answers, it's okay because our God's bigger than anything that they're going through. What a great ministry opportunity. A ministry opportunity to be with people that transitioned, made those changes, realized that their life wasn't any better because statistically it's not. Suicide rates do not go down oftentimes, and they decide to detransition. They decide to go back, but they have real ramifications. They burn bridges. They've lost friends. They lost family members. They've changed their body, sometimes irreversibly. What if we get to walk with them and be a champion of them? Couples in the LGBTQ world that have kids. And we're saying, you can't live like that anymore. You can't be with that person if you're gonna be a follower of Jesus and they've got kids. How can we come alongside them and give them God-honoring answers with the compassion of Christ? Families that have been destroyed because the, the prevailing wind is you either accept me and celebrate me fully or I consider you as an enemy to me and I'm leaving. And so parents lose their kids. Parent, grandparents lose their grandchildren. Individuals lose mom and dad, lose friends, lose teachers, lose coworkers. What if we were a part of the gospel reconciliation? And it might take an entire lifetime, but church, the same power that raised Christ from the dead resides on the inside of us. We're not going to win this by information and by clickbait and by news articles. We are going to win all of this, not against a people, but for a people. We are going to win this by the power and the mercy and the empowerment of the Holy Spirit residing on the inside of us. Lord, I thank you. We are over time, but Lord, I thank you that you are untangling maybe even the mess that I made in people's minds. God, let this settle in our hearts, not so much the depravity of the trans world, but Lord, the great and beautiful responsibility that we have to love the trans world. God, we thank you that we are not ill-equipped, even if we don't have answers today. We have the voice of the Holy Spirit, words of knowledge and wisdom, prophetic words, and words in season. God, words and tongues and interpretation of tongues. God, I thank you that you have given us by your spirit every tool that we, have, that we need and have necess that, that is necessary for us to minister and connect people back to you. Lord, we love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.